Welcome to the Organized Success Podcast brought to you by LiveBinders. In this episode, we have sound engineer Andrew Lapp joining Linda Hool and I as we explore the support of the Texas Deaf and Hard of Hearing and the Blind and Visually Impaired Communities provided by two longtime LiveBinders curators, Susie Tiggs and Chris Tabb. Susie is the Texas statewide lead for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services, and Chris is the mobility specialist at the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. As the pandemic continues on, two of Susie's binders caught our attention. Children's Stories in Sign Language and her Virtual Activities for Teachers and Families COVID-19 binder. We reached out to Susie to learn how Live Binders has helped her team work optimally, not only with COVID-19, but throughout a normal school year. And she was very gracious to candidly share her stories and invite her colleague, Chris, to share his experience with the blind and visually impaired. From app smashing to UDL, fairy godmother syndrome versus helicopter parents, or how Texas provides for outstanding leaders and role models in the deaf and blind communities, please join us for this very informative and uplifting podcast as we welcome Susie Tiggs and Chris Tabb. My name is Susie Tiggs. I am the statewide lead for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services in Texas. I work out of ESC Region 11 in Fort Worth, but I serve the entire state um, supporting the deaf ed programs and the local education agencies and making sure that they can do what they need to do with their deaf students. Tell us about you, Chris. Uh, Chris Tash, uh, Orientation Mobility Specialist. I, I'm the presently the statewide orientation mobility specialist at Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. So how did you discover Live Binders? Um, I first learned about Live Binders when I went to a conference, the Texas Computer Educators Association Conference, TCEA. Maybe back in 2012, I was trying to remember when I took some courses and um, a couple of the speakers were, were talking about those and I went and just absolutely fell in love and immediately realized all of the potential and the great things that I could do with it to provide services to the stakeholders that I work with and just became addicted might be a good word for it. <laughs> well, I know that you have done hundreds of binders. So addicted is probably a good word for that. I, I was looking at the public binder shelves and I was trying to count them. I think there's over a hundred that I counted that were public. I think there's 169, I think was the last number that I looked and maybe not quite that many that are private ones, but. Um, That's great. Yeah, I have found that if, if somebody calls with a question, then I can put it together in a live binder, all the answers, because if one person has a question, so will other people. And then I tell people that it's a living, living document because two weeks later I come across a new resource and I add it to there. And I tell them that there is a cost for them to use my live binders. They have to send me updated information as they come across it. And oh, periodically great. I'll do that. So it's, you know, the more people that can work together on it to get all the resources, the better it's going to benefit everybody. Yeah. And it's, it, you have so much there. Every binder is just rich with resources and some point to other binders. So you continue mm -hmm. the, the sharing. Do you ever come across people who, um, who are working on their own live binders? Does that ever happen? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, that I've introduced a lot of people to live binders. There are people who already knew about live binders. And so a lot of my live binders point to other people's. There's point to mine, but um, there's a few people at our service center that I work with who use them and some of the others. And of course, Chris um, picked that up as well and has been using them. So Chris, that's how you came to learn live binders. I yes, yeah, Susie sets a terrific example and uh, the live binders have just been a terrific way to share information. And uh, sometimes it's something where it's, uh, many people are accessing it. Sometimes it's used by a tool for families and smaller teams. So we won't really see a blip or a bubble. It's something that is used by just a few individuals but allows them to all be on the same page, which uh, certainly in our COVID times has become much more relevant. Uh, but even in regular times when uh, we have busy lives and the live binders allows people to all know what's happening and go back to those references and resources 
to be able to have access at any point, whether it's their phone or their computer, however it is, uh, could be uploading videos of students doing certain skills, or maybe a parent sharing at home what a child is able to do at home so that the school team can know what the abilities are at home. Oh, that's great. Hmm. Yeah, we did want to kind of dive in. Uh, we were excited to learn how this all adapted with COVID-19. So I, I do want to make sure we get to that. I'm going to hand over to Linda because she, she's going to start off, you know, with the two binders that she discovered. And that's how we kind of came to you. And hopefully that'll lead us to all these questions we have. Okay, awesome. As I was saying, I, I come across your binders all the time. Um, the last my last position had DHH students in the school and I used to do the website and was always so disappointed because I found so many few resources back in the 2000s and I would have been nuts linking from here in Illinois to your binders for the quantity and quality of information you have and the first binder that I happened to come across was your virtual activities because it was COVID uh, you know, it was COVID-19 and, mm -hmm. and you just were sharing it and it, the content was for anybody. It just wasn't for your specific students from the live stream down to the uh, free resources, which I love the word free and the free family. And I thought all of that was valuable to anybody seeking information in relation to COVID let alone the COVID information you provided. And I love the fact that you save time and you embed other binders within your, pro, you know, within your own binders. In other words, why reinvent the wheel? Because the questions and answers could be in that binder. So that Absolutely. was my first one. And I tweeted about it way back in April. Um, okay, where is it here? Um, I always, well, I'm just going to go over to it. You okay. link within this binder to my favorite. Oh, and I? in June, I did a tweet about two kindergarten teachers that created a live binder full of stories where either they read or pulled in YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And then I came across yours and I had to review it because I just thought, I did not realize how much was on the web for sign language stories. And I just marveled at how much was there from the um, sign language channel and all the videos here. And then I traveled over and I looked at um, the storytelling QR codes to another 180. And then my favorite is the various stories tab because you could just go from one to the other where the kids are getting signed a story. And as a librarian, that just goes you know to the heart of what reading is all about and the opportunity for the dhh students so those are the things that you know that caught my eye and this one in particular is my favorite oh well i'm glad that's one that i put together um several years ago that one's not a new one uh, one of my uh, favorite groups to work with are kids who have additional disabilities who are deaf and so my students who are deaf blind are students who have cognitive disabilities and so i put together this live binder originally to help the special education teachers because often they don't know all of the ASL resources or the sign language resources. And this was a way for them to introduce some of these resources to their students, to the families as well. Many of these tabs are, are brand new tabs that came out in March when, um, you know, everybody started pulling things together. The, the one that you showed that um, multiple stories tab most of those are older the ones that have been there for a while but the one with the qr codes was one that somebody put together um just on that happened in march or april and so a lot of us were watching for new resources that were being um shared and then put it together in however we were curating resources live binder is generally how i I did mine. Other people uh, did things like this, and there was a lot of um, 
Google activities. People created Google folders and shared those. So that's a lot of what's in my other live binder. Just anything that we could do, because you're right, there's very limited resources for our population. And so when I came across things that were applicable, I did what I could to pull it together. But our kids are general education kids before anything else. And a lot of those resources that are appropriate for all school age kids are going to be appropriate for our students as well. So making sure that our students, our teachers had access to materials that other teachers are doing, and then they could adapt them in sign language or doing things with braille or tactile, however that needed to be. A lot of these sign stories were ones that, um, like there were a lot of groups that were doing virtual field trips to so the Cincinnati Zoo, and we pulled together all of the interpreters in Texas, like that one right there, and asked interpreters who were willing to donate their time. And so they would go back and they would add the sign language to some of the virtual field trips that were happening to make sure that it was accessible to our students. Oh, that's great. Oh, that is, yeah. Yeah, it was wonderful the way everybody came together and, and shared things. Facebook and Twitter and all of the social media helped us to know what everybody else was doing and then we could all put it together in our curation. It's been a lot of fun um, sharing resources and see what everybody is doing. That's what I that's what I like about live binders too, is what you can share and when you've got everybody pulling together, that is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it makes me think about this term that I just learned. There's a term called app smashing. Are you guys familiar with it? I have heard app smashing. Yeah. So this, that would be a good example of, of your binders doing where people mm -hmm. are working with the technology they're comfortable with and you bring it in together so that everybody, you know, nobody has to, to convert anything. You're, mm -hmm. you're allowing the Google folder to be accessible. And I think that was like a Canva document maybe. I'm not sure what the QR code was done on, but so all of those get, I guess, the term smashed together uh, <laughs> in your binders. So it's a great example of that. It's a good way because, you know, we all started with bookmarks on our computer and then we had thousands of bookmarks and we moved to another computer and the bookmarks didn't come. And then eventually they were able to to go from computer to computer, but when you still have a thousand, that didn't help so much. And so, you know, I found I could send an email to one parent or one teacher with resources. A month later, somebody else would ask me for resources and I'd have to go find that other email oh, right. and, mm -hmm. and do that. Putting it in a live binder helped. And I started doing that for workshops and everything as well. When I do a presentation, I create a live binder for the presentation. I put whatever um, slide deck that I'm using, mostly Google Slides, but sometimes PowerPoint, and then all of the resources that I used to gather the information and then continue to add to it as I go. You know, you said something earlier, and I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, Linda, but um, you know how the general students need this information as well. I mean, it's all useful. And it made me think about, you know, the push for UDL right now. Is that something you guys are familiar with? Universal Design for Learning in the Classroom? Definitely. Yes. Yeah, we do a lot with UDL because um, what we have found is that strategies that are really good for our students who are deaf or hard of hearing, blind or visually impaired or deaf blind, are often strategies that are good for all kids. Using mm -hmm. the visual components that we do in deaf ed and the kinesthetic and the tactile that we do with our kids who are blind or, or deaf blind help all of the students. Yeah, it's another way to trigger your brain activity, I guess, and, and mm -hmm. add context to what you're trying to, to understand. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think it also makes us all one community to understand and see um, how we all do things and how similar we can do things, but in our own mode of operation, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really interested in hearing, um, and I don't know if, um, if Susie or Chris wants to take this, um, but wh where do you go once you share resources like these, especially like right now, um, when I know like a lot of students are at home and I know we all have kind of different situations, um, but like wh what do you do beyond just sharing resources? Are, are there any like additional steps um, that, you know, as educators, you guys are taking um, to sort of make sure that uh, these resources are being used effectively? Chris, do you want to take that one? 
Well, sure. Um, one of the things that we try to do is make sure that people are, uh, have access to the information and know about it. Uh, there's some people who um, are just, uh, they live in live binders um, and because it's a, an environment where they can find the resources and tools that they need. Other people are, are just entering the field or are really scrambling for where they can find resources. And as you know, if you do a Google search, it, the, the numbers go on exponentially. Um, so we have different communication systems that we have within the field. Uh, we have specialized listservs and different ways that we communicate. Social media has been a big boon where we can uh, advertise something. I don't know if advertise is the right way to put it, but basically just make a note that it's there. Um, and then there's lots of discussions and the follow-up that happen. And that's where a lot of the learning occurs because people share additional resources. People talk about how they've used different things. And so we get an idea uh, if those tools are effective, if people need more information, uh, including your email address for that has also helped to bring in new suggestions. Uh, recently, I uh, was working on a project of uh, developing role models for people who are blind and visually impaired, as well as those who are deafblind. And it brought in a tremendous amount of input from others who knew people who would be terrific role models for young people uh, who are looking for adults who have these types of disabilities to be able to uh, serve as role models in their lives, to be able to look up to and uh, have some vocational pursuits uh, for their life. Chris, I'm so glad you brought that up because that is how I came across your binders. I think I, it was, must have been a tweet. I thought, wow, what a great idea to put ro a binder full of role models out there. And I did see some of the exchange that went on, which was great. I think you, you were right. You really hit a nerve on that, that people were really interacting with this suggestion that you made. I, I don't know that that was ever... It's a, this one? a, a universal mm -hmm. need um, mm -hmm. for, for all of our young people, but especially those with disabilities, how do they find somebody to look up to? Um, often there isn't another person in their family who has that particular disability. And so uh, the families themselves are also looking for resources, places to find things that they can uh, share with their children to know what types of things would be good to uh, look into. How do they do a particular job? Is it possible for them to do those things? Right. So I would imagine that this binder is going to continue to evolve. Is that something that you take on? It's been a better juggling act, especially with COVID, with all the things that we're involved in, right. uh, trying to uh, address school concerns as school is just beginning. And so I hope to be able to spend more time on this. Uh, but there's, let's just say, a dozen or so uh, names up there for people to begin with, at least. Uh, fortunately, sometimes people who are highlighted are also willing to be personally contacted. Um, and so the questions come about uh, both uh, who would be a good role model and then uh, how people get involved. And so uh, hopefully that will continue to grow. So I had questions. Um, you were talking about people using your binders. Um, who are these people? Are they the instructors? Are they parents? Are they, are they specific to teaching the blind and the deaf? There's one binder in particular that's kind of a hybrid uh, that it, in the orientation mobility that is specifically targeted at parents. So initially, it would be the professionals who um, kind of hijack that live binder um, to be able to share those resources with parents. Then okay. they can either share out those resources individually or they can share the entire binder. Uh, just another wonderful way that uh, parents don't have to feel that they have to have a live binders account to be able to access the information um, so right. it's, uh, COVID has created lots of new conditions. So I had a question, um, you know, you guys are committed to the success of your students academically. Does that involve like the social side as well? Like we were wondering, you know, that you've got the system organized, you know, in your middle school, high schools, but what happens when they leave the classroom? Like, is there assistance or is it being addressed in PE, you know, at a football game, at a school event, lunch cafeteria? A lot of it depends on the school and it depends on all of the additional resources. If the students are at a, um, a site that has a lot of deaf students, they usually are going to lunch together. They're often in their um, general education classes together with an interpreter. Those that are um, not on a deaf ed campus where they're out in their own campuses are going with their gen ed peers. Sometimes they can access and understand everybody else real well, sometimes not as much. 
um, our kids who are blind and visually impaired usually don't have, they're not clustered together on campuses like our deaf students are, unless they're at Texas School for the Blind or Visually Impaired. And they don't, um, they don't often have somebody with them, such as an interpreter. Some of them have may have a paraprofessional, but they go to all the same classes that their peers go to. And um, the teachers usually are pretty good about making sure that they have access. And that's where like the teachers that Chris works with, the teachers that I work with, the orientation and mobility specialists that Chris works with, help make sure that our students have access to the same activities that the rest of the students do. And there is, um, for the blind and visually impaired, uh, something called the expanded core curriculum. There's actually a separate expanded core curriculum for deaf and hard of hearing that Susie can share about. Um, the, the expanded core curriculum for uh, students who are blind and visually impaired in Texas is considered basically, well, it's a law, an educational um, requirement that students who are blind and visually impaired be evaluated in these nine areas, nine areas that typically we don't teach. So typically we don't teach kids how to play or how to have social interactions. Mm -hmm. But those are things that we deliberately instruct on, we evaluate, see if there's needs. And if there are needs that we provide instruction to make sure that those things that would happen incidentally, just by watching are things that are taught more deliberately. We make sure that we explicitly have lessons and activities to help students develop skills to understand um, basically what would you do if you didn't have a facial expression to interpret? Um, how do you engage in play when you can't see what's happening? How do you initiate or join a, join a game? Those okay. Are, those are things that we typically don't teach. We just figure kids learn how to do that at home through their siblings. Um, but because our students wouldn't have the access to that same information, we make that part of their curriculum. Unfortunately, they don't get an extra 12 hours in the day to do it. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's, they, they have the, the general curriculum plus this expanded core curriculum, which includes things like the orientation mobility, getting around without looking, so to speak, uh, assistive technology, social skills, uh, and even things like self-determination so that they can overcome some of the social expectations or social stigma that might go along with a disability. So I hear you saying that we don't teach to it, but then it sounds like you do. Well, we, we don't offer it as a general for any student, though most students could benefit from these things like career education. Uh, these are nine areas that we do deliberately teach for students who are identified as being visually impaired and blind and needing special education. The assumption is that most students are picking this up um, just watching their families, watching um, other kids. They learn this stuff without having to be directly taught, where our students aren't, aren't seeing other people do that, or the parents aren't necessarily teaching the students to do that because they don't necessarily understand, first of all, that it needs to be directly taught, or they don't know how to go about doing it. Right, right. It needs some kind of a structure, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious, has this been around for a long time or is this, is this new? Is it still developing? It, this is something that's been um, introduced since the 90s, I believe, maybe even before that. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Phil Hatlin, who was, uh, I think he started originally in Berkeley and then moved to Texas and was uh, superintendent at the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. He and others introduced what was called the National Agenda uh, to help uh, at, on the national front to bring these uh, nine areas into common language. Uh, but it's still an education game, even for our educators to learn about them. Texas is unique that Texas actually has this on the books in educational code other states do not. Mm -hmm. And it's the VI that has it on the books. Deaf and hard of hearing um, is newer to the game. It came out in about 2004 um, and it's still not in the books. It's still not recognized. And there's still a lot of teachers who work with students who are deaf or hard of hearing who've never heard of the expanded core curriculum. For right. students who are deaf or hard of hearing, we're looking at um, things like, does the child even understand what their audiogram is? Can they explain to somebody what they can hear or what type of accommodations they need? Um, do they know how to access an interpreter outside of school if, you know, you don't go to the doctor and just assume one's going to be provided? So teaching a lot of those skills, it's not unusual for our kids to get to college 
and the disabled student services coordinator says, okay, what kind of a, accommodations do you need? And the student can't answer that because it's always just been magically yeah, provided. Yeah. In the yeah. VI world, we call it the fairy godmother syndrome mm. and things just magically appear. You mentioned an audiogram and could you explain for us what that is? An audiogram is a way of measuring what somebody can hear. So there is a chart um, and the audiologist who's the specialist in that would present a variety of sounds, um, different high pitch, low pitch, louder, quieter, and then they would chart on a on a graph where the student was able to respond. There is what they call a speech banana that shows that area where most of the sounds, um, most of the speech sounds show up the easiest. And so if you've got a student whose whose graph, whose audiogram is is lower than that, they are not hearing um, up in that frequency, those are speech sounds that they're going to be missing. So as you're talking to them and as you are um, teaching them to speak, they're not going to be able to hear or understand those so well. A student who has a mild hearing loss, it's going to be up in that 15 to 20, 25 dB um, as, you, as you get with a lot um, lower hearing thresholds you have somebody who has a moderate hearing impairment or um, that all the way to profound hearing loss where they may not be able to hear anything at all. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is there's kind of a gap between, um, you know, the people who can measure this in students and then students actually knowing for themselves um, sort of like what, what exactly mm -hmm. the different thresholds are. Exactly. Or they may be able to say, I have a moderate hearing loss, but for them to actually be able to explain what that means is I can hear um, you if we're one on one in a small room conversation, but if there's other people I may not be able to hear or, you know, them to being able to Im explain the implications of that. What does that look like in a classroom? Right. So you're saying that's uh, something that you need to teach them to be able to articulate as opposed yes. to some, so it's, so it's not something that somebody has to test them on and then it's written down. They need um, to be able to articulate it. Yeah, they are tested on it and it is written down, but many of the students can't actually explain it. Right. It's not explicitly taught to the students. And so if they have to explain it to somebody else, they can't always do that. Well, it's funny, um, you know, you said fairy godmother, and it, it made me think of universal design of learning. I'm, I'm tying this to mm -hmm. it, just to the general population. You know, it makes me think mm -hmm. of helicopter moms, right? Yes. You have so <laughs> many kids coming from high school, doesn't matter, that don't know how to even talk about what they want to do or what, how they like to study or what subject really, you know, is their strength or weakness. I mean, it can go all over the board. I mean, it would be... Mm -hmm. Nice to know if we could, if the kids could learn, you know, this is who I am today and this is how mm -hmm. I process information and this is how I socialize, right? Social mm -hmm. skills. Going off to college is just so, such a big unknown for so many mm -hmm. kids if they're not able to articulate it. So, exactly. And we're not always real good at school about working on that. You know, this is the way I teach. So, therefore, this is the way you're going to learn. And, as we start looking at making accommodations for children with disabilities, people begin to realize, well, wait a minute, it's not just my kids with disabilities that benefit from this. And that's where that universal design for learning has really helped. If you build that into your lesson plans and into your classroom to begin with, then you don't necessarily have to make specific accommodations for this child or that one, because you've built it all in to begin with. And it benefits all of the kids because there are other kids who learn better visually or auditorily exactly. or kinesthetically. Yeah, I think you just said that very nicely, very mm -hmm. well articulated. What, why that is so valuable, the mm -hmm. Universal Design for Learning UDL. I, and I, 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 I'm going to be thinking about the fairy godmother, you know, where it just happens. One of the favorite videos that I show um, in some of my deaf-blind coursework or my blind coursework is a man who... Uh, is an orientation and mobility specialist who's blind and he talks about apples 
and you know very intelligent man he was at his piano class his mom was late the piano teacher gave him an apple and it was a whole apple and he didn't know what to do with it because oh. his apples had always been served cut in smaller pieces mm -hmm. and nobody had ever told him that an apple starts out as a whole apple wow. in his mind they were always small pieces and those are things we don't necessarily think about our children who can see watch us cut up that apple they've seen the red apple to begin with then they see it in pieces then they taste it but if it magically appears on a plate kids may right. not understand that it grew on a tree and then we bought it at the store and then it was in the fridge and then you know all the components to it oh it's so interesting <laughs> how much we communicate through assumptions yes exactly because when it comes to um sort of sharing these resources um with 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 the actual students like this um uh, especially i guess i'm more curious about um students who are vi or visually impaired um like, what are some ways that you can share, like, specifically, like, these online resources with them? I'd like to say that I'm just tickled pink uh, that LiveBinders has been so open and helpful. Uh, the way that people who are blind and visually impaired access information online is through a variety of systems, often using a screen reader. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, more and more browsers are having accessibility built into their systems where you don't need to add a separate system. Uh, but LiveBinders has been very responsive when the individuals that I ask for help reach out to say, you know, could you help me with this link? Or maybe this isn't working the way I would anticipate it to be. And LiveBinders has been very responsive in making those things accessible. Um, and so we try to make sure that, for instance, a PDF used to be that if I wanted a picture of a document from 1970, um, as a PDF, I would literally take a picture of it. And that's how that PDF would come out is one giant image. The challenge for someone using a screen reader is that it wouldn't pick up the text. Right. Now we have accessible PDFs. And as long as we're posting accessible documents onto live binders, it makes it much more accessible for students, for families, or uh, other individuals who are uh, using accessibility features to be able to have that information. And right. So yeah, because that, that would have been my main concern is that um, is that people with um, uh, who, people who are visually impaired are sort of reliant, you know, on stuff being read to them, you know, by like, you know, people in their lives. So, yeah, it's good to hear that they have a way to get the information themselves. Mm -hmm. When we started using LiveBinder, that was a real consideration. We always look to make sure that the tool is going to be accessible. There's some great apps and great tools out there that the screen readers or whichever technology somebody who's blind or visually impaired is using um, doesn't play well with the app. And so we were very excited to find out that LiveBinder is something that our stakeholders could use. And if it's if we find great apps that aren't accessible, we don't use them. So we mm -hmm. need our people to be able to access things. Yeah. And I'm curious, kind of, um, this is going back to um, Chris's binder, but I, either of you can answer this. When it comes to, you know, you guys were talking about role models earlier, and I'm just wondering, have you, um, you know, kept track of any of uh, your students' progress and seen any of them develop into um, someone who you would consider, you know, maybe putting in that role model binder, Chris, or um, just maybe like a story that you have shared with someone, Susie? That's an excellent suggestion, Andrew. And um, uh, I, you, you're reminding me of a, a, a young man who went from um, just being challenged with some basic skills to now uh, he's living in a penthouse here in Austin and uh, has gotten into many, many things. So um, <laughs> you're, it's, you're, you're making me think about who I wanna reach out to to add next. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate to hear so many wonderful stories about our students as they continue on in life. And Susie probably has some more. Uh, yeah, definitely so. And from my students who are deaf blind, um, my students who are deaf or hard of hearing, and I'm also a teacher of the visually impaired as well, especially since I've been doing this for 30 plus years. Um, some of my students have grandkids, which make me feel really old, but, but watching some of the exciting things that they're doing and seeing them be independent, and it just makes me feel very proud knowing that I had 
even just a tiny bit of time in their life to help that happen? Andrew, that was such a great question. Um, I really think that that's something that really needs to get out there. Thinking about these students of yours who've gone on to have independent lives mm -hmm. and um, what great role models they well, could and be. I think, yeah, what great I think stories for is, anyone, for anyone. Exactly, exactly. And so many people don't realize that uh, people who are deaf or people who are blind or people who are deaf blind can live independent lives and be very successful. And it's not unusual for parents when they first get that diagnosis. Oh, no, my child is blind. They'll have to live with me forever. Oh, they're deaf. They'll never be independent. And um, I can't speak so much from the VI world part of it, but I've got friends who are doctors and lawyers who are blind or who are deaf. And one of the pictures that you were showing in Chris's live binder is a deaf blind lawyer. She was the first graduate from Harvard, first deaf blind graduate from Harvard. And so, you know, deaf doesn't mean can't, mm -hmm. blind doesn't mean can't, deaf blind doesn't mean can't. It's different. So with COVID-19, I would love to hear the challenges with that. And then wondering, you know, did other states reach out to you for your resources or have you seen, you know, your, your resources being used across the board? And then also what are the challenges with the masks and, and not being in the classroom and all of that? Mm -hmm. From the deaf and hard of hearing standpoint, my binders have been used for a while um, across the U.S. and, and even I don't remember if it was Chris or one of his coworkers told me that they had given it to some people in England. So um, Great. just as we work with uh, different um, individuals, different organizations, it, it gets used all over. Um, I'm part of a national organization that works with um, students who are deaf or hard of hearing, or works with teachers who work with students. And so a lot of the resources are, are shared through there as well. And as we collaborate and learn more, we we add them to them as well. I don't know how much of a, a of an advance it, it gave us when it came to COVID, except for the sign language stories binder, right. um, because that one really was a big help for teachers who were looking for virtual activities. Um, I do have some that are on um, like self-determination or social skills, things like that, that the teachers, um, because a lot of those resources are online games or online activities, they were able to tap into those. I think that the biggest thing that helped honestly with my group is they were familiar with my live binders and they were familiar with the way that I do things. So when this all started happening, they just went to Susie Tiggs live binder, Googled it, figuring that I probably would start putting something together. Hmm. Um, and I had our last day of school was Friday the 13th when I woke up Saturday morning and looked on Facebook and there were 5 million questions and mm. resources sharing. I started throwing those, literally throwing those in there. So when I look at how many hits that live binder has gotten, that was created March 14th. <laughs> and, you know, wow. it's, it's by far... Uh, you know, definitely had the most hits. Um, the sign language one, I think I made in 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. So while it has a lot of hits, it's been around for a while. So mm -hmm. it was, um, it was yeah. great to have a way to put them all together. And then we started sharing other people's resources. If, if there was an organization in Ohio that put together a list, it was in the live binder. And in turn, they were sharing the live binder in their newsletters. And um, pretty much many of the organizations around the U.S. that were doing that were taking advantage of what we had been able to curate and vice versa. So what are some of the biggest challenges with the COVID environment for you guys? For us in the deaf and hard of hearing world, the masks are a real hard thing. Um, our, our students, even those who use sign language, really depend very strongly on the facial expressions. And that's covered up with the masks. A lot of our students who don't use sign language um, do depend on that speech reading or the facial expression. And they use their hearing some too. 
and the mask really muffles mm -hmm. the sound. So for them being able to pick up anything from somebody's face or use what hearing that they've got, um, it's diminished, it's gone. And so it means that our students have very limited access in the classroom as they're doing virtual, um, they may try and put captions, but our younger students don't know how to read. So if a student um, say is first or second grade and doesn't use sign language because they have enough hearing not to need sign language, the quality of the microphone, what the teacher's using, what equipment they've got may mean that the sound doesn't come through as clear and they no longer have access to the hearing part of it but you couldn't just put captions on and assume that they're going to be able to, to use that either. Right. So it's been just a lot of creativity um, and one, one by one figuring out what are we going to do for this child? How are we going to meet for this child? And um, just hope that everybody is, is willing to take the time. We've got a lot of districts who have been very concerned about that and are making sure that everything needs to happen. And then we've got others who have said, you know what, we've got thousands of other kids, we'll worry about them later. Um, yeah. Luckily, not as, as many as, as it could be. But I don't know so much from, from Krista's standpoint, what type of things have you guys run into virtually with the, well, virtually and then also COVID? Just in, in the world in general, if you're deaf blind and your world um, is through touch with other people mm -hmm. and we have social distancing, how do you do that? Um, so the, the impacts for many of the populations that we work with are much, much, much more profound in terms of isolation uh, because who's going to want to touch when you're not supposed to be near anyone? Um, and if you're using communication language through signing in someone's hand, uh, that all disappears. Mm -hmm. um, we have other things where, for instance, orientation mobility, we are uh, basically focused on helping people to move about in their communities, in their environments. But if students aren't able to come back to school um, or, or there's hesitancy to do that, it makes it very difficult. We've been seeing lots of uh, hybrid models where sometimes uh, students will be half the students in the classroom, half the students at home. Orientation mobility specialists sometimes are able to meet with uh, students in the communities uh, or at their homes. Uh, other times we have to kind of create a situation for learning online where we might use uh, some type of video conferencing system where someone could be out in the community and somebody else could be uh, getting that information. We might do sound recordings of intersections and have those available through a live binder or other manners. Um, so that people can get audio information about um, crossing an intersection or listening to different environmental sounds, so uh, sensory efficiency skills that we try to develop. It's been a very challenging time for many professionals and families on how do you make this happen? Uh, having a half an hour lesson uh, in person is much different than having a half an hour lesson or an hour lesson online. Uh, and for many of our parents, they need to support their young uh, children in doing those things. Uh, and it's difficult for the parents to do that when they have multiple children or they have to be at work. And so uh, we've encountered many, many new challenges that no one, no one anticipated. Mm -hmm. But the tools like Live Binders uh, and uh, video conferencing programs, Zoom or Google Meet or uh, Microsoft Teams, those have made much, uh, much more efficient work of, of being able to connect. Okay. When I hear of all these challenges, is there there seems to me to be a demand for increase in professionals in all areas of this, these students' uh, needs. And there needs to be professionals from the interpreters to the teachers to this, any of the specialists need, needed. Is get, gathering professionals a difficult uh, situation probably across the country? Across the country, definitely. Last year, we had 43 unfilled Teacher of the Deaf positions in Texas. And we had 99 unfilled interpreter positions. Hmm. COVID has also created some new challenges because we already struggle with bringing people into the field. But now many of the people who are trying to get into the field, um, if they do work under blindfold, they can't do that remotely. Um, for those that are trying to uh, 
observe lessons or do their internships, it's difficult for our professionals to provide internships when they're just learning to teach in a new way themselves. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a bubble coming up for the next year or two where it will be more challenging to get new people into the field because there's delays through the university process based on COVID. So I want to make sure uh, that you guys get to, if there's anything that we didn't cover that you guys wanted to cover, I mean, we're very, you know, we want you guys to... Um, if I could encourage uh, other related professions to check things out, um, it's a wonderful thing about uh, live binders being open to everyone uh, in the public binder is that, um, for instance, an audiologist who would work with, uh, with a student who is deaf, heart, deaf, hard of hearing and their families, um, often uh, what works well for communication is the exact opposite of something that we might hope for for people who are blind and visually impaired who are listening for noise to help them mm -hmm. but an audiologist is typically going to eliminate noise to enhance communication hmm. and so um, there are many resources that Susie has and that are in the O&M binders to help audiologists and other occupational therapists physical therapists those that also work with our students who may benefit from the information that's contained here though it's not listed for those professions there's lots mm -hmm. of uh, good information to be able to help those that we work with across the board. Exactly. Um, our students are not just um, deaf on Monday, blind on Tuesday, have uh, physical disabilities on Wednesday, and they all, they all play in there together. So if I don't understand the um, communication part of a child and I'm working with them on seating, there are things that we can be doing together. And I know that a lot of what Chris does and a lot of what I do are reaching out to those other professionals. What can I be doing as I work with him on this to also incorporate your stuff into it? They don't always recognize that the need for it to go the other way as well. And, you know, we've definitely found with the orientation and mobility for our students who are deafblind, the, the things that we usually do with the hearing aids to help the students hear better or hear more effectively are just killing what Chris is doing out in the community. We, we don't want the kids to hear the background noise so they can hear the speech, but if you don't hear the background noise, you get hit by a car. So <laughs> kind yeah. of weighing that, and that's where that team work really helps immensely. I wanted to ask you guys if you had to summarize what, you know, in maybe one or two words or sentences, what gets you excited about the success that you've had with your, your program? For, for me, I always think about um, the concept that the kids are worth it. The kids deserve it. So anything that we can be doing to help make teachers, interpreters, administrators better prepared, and in turn seeing that success for their students reminds me why I do what I do. And that's where I really look at having, I think our ultimate goal is to work ourselves out of a job. Not that we're real worried about it happening, but the more capacity that we see the individual school districts have, um, the better that is for our students. Chris may have different different things to weigh in on that. Took the words right out of my, my mouth, Susie. That uh, my my goal is to work myself out of a job. Um, <laughs> and when when uh, I, the, the the emails haven't stopped coming, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. But but the more we can provide, knowing that the people have what they need uh, to deliver that to students and families, uh, and knowing that students are able to go on to accomplish the things that they uh, hope to be able to do in life and have those the confidence to know that they can go to any college and access the information and the buildings and uh, community services that they need, that, that's the ultimate payoff. Well, we just really appreciate that all that you've done to create this amazing tool that has um, really just made Chris and I very happy. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. It's great to hear how useful it has been for you guys. And mm -hmm. That's one of the things that kept drawing me to your binders is that look at what you're doing and you put the tool to marvelous use to the benefit of your community. And I think that's fantastic. For the opportunity to share today. Yes, we definitely appreciate it. it not everybody understands that that our, that our kids are 
the most important kids in the whole wide world and that <laughs> what we do often it gets overlooked. So we appreciate you, you pointing that out and helping us to share. 